The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, everyone, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you all to the Dibble Institute's second Wednesday webinar, our first one of 2019, and it is titled, What Do We Really Know About the Cycle of Violence? Research and Practical Implications, and this is going to be by Dr. Megan Hazelshort at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. My name is Rachel Savasic luxton for the Dibble Institute, and behind the scenes is the wonderful Kathy, who is our webinar organizer and who keeps all of this kind of working for us. So before we get into the webinar, I just want to go over some housekeeping items, including the phone number and access code to use if you are unable or don't prefer to access the audio through or for the webinar through your computer, you can call in at this phone number and use that code. So go ahead and write it down just in case there are any technical issues as we go along. Also, there are several ways to participate in the webinar. So we're going to have some poll questions during the presentation. And at the end, there will be some time for some Q&A with Megan. We do ask that you write down and save any content-related questions until closer to the end of this presentation, just so that they don't get mixed up with anyone who may be writing in with some access-related issues. And lastly, in a couple of days, you will be able to access the recording of this webinar at our website at the link that's uh, included here on this slide. And I'll be handing this over in just a moment, but before I do, I'd like to present some background information on the Dibble Institute for those of you who may be listening in for the first time. So this is our founder, Charlie Dibble, and his wife, Helen. Charlie was an engineer by trade, and as such, he sought uh, solutions to issues. So about 30 years ago, he saw how young people's relationships and those of their parents were affecting the outcomes of young people, and not always in a positive way, like we'll talk about today. So he began asking lead experts in the field of education what was being done to help young people develop skills to create stable families. And the Dibble Institute continues his work by advocating for the effectiveness of relationship skill programming for youth and young adults, and also by publishing research and evidence-based relationship education materials. So next slide, please. So Dibble is a national nonprofit mission-driven uh, mission organization. We're able to reach many young people thanks to the efforts of uh, a lot of you here on the webinar and many of our others partnering with us. We couldn't have reached the 1.5 million young people that we have in the last 15 years without caring people like each of you. So I just want to take a second to acknowledge that and say a big thank you to all of you for your hard work. And um, I'd Next, I'd like to go over some of our, our core values and just briefly highlight those. So the first is that we believe in research. We rely on current research to keep our materials up to date and relevant, which is why you'll see that we um, have updates here and there as uh, the research and the information changes. We also make those changes ourselves. And then we also believe in Next slide. <laughs> and stable, healthy families of all different types. So research continues to show that children do best when raised in a healthy environment with two parents and that their relationship uh, matters whether those parents are together or apart. But I'd like to point out that it doesn't mean that we are anti-divorce. We understand that not all families have two parents in the household and research supports that complex, high conflict and abusive situations aren't good for children. Like again, Megan will highlight today. So we support stable and healthy families. That includes single parents, grandparents, step parents, and extended family um, parenting situations who just do great jobs and have great outcomes with their children. And lastly, we believe that all people deserve respect and that all relationships can be improved through relationship skills. So now for the real reason that you all are here, I want to go ahead and introduce Dr. Megan Hazelshort, who is an assistant professor in the Child and Family Studies Department at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And she is also one of my amazing and incredibly talented mentors from my doctoral program. Along with her research team of graduate and undergraduate students and collaborators, Megan studies intimate partner violence from the perspective of women, children exposed to interparental violence in their family of origin, and social service providers working with women and children. She's the director of the family, of Vi family violence across the lifespan research team that she established while on faculty at Auburn University. And her and her research team are active members on the Knoxville Domestic Violence Coordinated Community Response Team. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and pass this along to you, Megan. <laughs> 
Thank you, Rachel, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm impressed and excited by the number of people that have registered, and I hope that we'll have plenty of time at the end for some discussion and questions. Um, in preparing for this webinar, I remembered that we in violence research and prevention often use the phrase cycle of violence to mean many different things. One of the most common uses of the cycle of violence refers to Lenore Walker's graphic depicted here with violence escalating from tension building to the violence itself and then to a honeymoon phase. And this is an important aspect of the work we do, but it won't be the focus of today's webinar. And I just wanted to make that clear up front because it is often, often referred to as the cycle of violence. So instead, we will be spending the next um, hour focused on what we sometimes refer to as the cycle of violence or intergenerational transmission of violence. This cycle of violence refers to the patterns of violence that may start in childhood with exposure to interparental violence or interparental domestic violence and continue into what we sometimes see as dating violence in adolescence as well as into adulthood with intimate partner violence. And this is a particularly important cycle of violence to be focused on because researchers and practitioners alike have been focused these past few decades on how we can best break this cycle of violence. So we'll be spending time today discussing this. Um, before I jump in, I want to acknowledge that whenever we are discussing topics like family violence exposure and dating violence, it might impact you or others you work with in a personal way due to past, but also potentially current experiences. Um, though I will use some quotes from young people's experiences towards the end of the presentation, I will not be using any violent or disturbing images or going into much detail about violence itself. Um, nevertheless, you may still want to engage in some self-care or talk to people in your office after this webinar because we know that talking about and learning about violence violence and abuse, even without graphic detail, can cause some of us some distress. So I'm going to spend the first half of our presentation of my um, half webinar, a little bit less than that, um, defining and discussing the com key components of the cycle of violence. So exposure to interparental violence, dating violence, catching us up on the state of the research. And then I'll spend the majority of my time talking about some of my research on the young adults live and learn and helping us shift from just having a discussion around dating violence towards also um, other forms of adolescent relationships like healthy romantic relationships, risks and resilience and so on. So we're gonna start with a poll question here to get started before we go in depth with the children's exposure component here. So Kathy, I'll cue you, okay? Sure. And, and this is a quick poll that says, youth are considered exposed to interparental domestic violence if they directly witnessed or see the event. And so you have uh, the option of either true or false. And I'll pause for a few moments. Okay. We give you a couple more seconds here to get some more voting. Just use your mouse and click. Oops, sorry okay. about that. It's okay. Okay, great. Um, so I figured there would be a variety of responses. Obviously, there's only two options. But so it looks like um, some of you are familiar with the ways in which youth could be exposed to violence. Um, and some people are more focused on the directly witnessing. And that's the most common way we often think about exposure to violence. So that's a good segue into our, our next section and our focus for a moment on exposure to interparental violence. So millions of youth uh, millions of youth are exposed to domestic violence during childhood and adolescence, and this could take the form of one parent using violence towards the other or both parents using violence towards each other, so in a more mutual or bi-directional sort of way. Um, when I say exposure to domestic violence, I'm referring to the number of ways in which youth can learn about violence in their homes. So oftentimes we think of the direct exposure experiences like witnessing the violence, hearing about it, intervening to try to help one or both partners, I'm sorry, parents, um, or being accidentally victimized. Um, but we also have indirect exposure, and this includes things like experiencing the aftermath, so maybe seeing a mother's injury the next day or having with older kids, adolescents, having to bail a parent out of jail. Um, we also hear of young adults, I'm sorry, adolescents and children who hear about the violence from someone else without directly seeing it, like from a sibling. So we know that youth are oftentimes exposed in a variety of ways, often direct and indirect. Um, but research suggests that the closer the youth is to the violence, so for example, intervening in it versus only hearing about it from a sibling, poses a greater risk for the youth for a variety of adjustment outcomes and difficulties. So research consistently shows that youth exposed to domestic violence are at a greater risk for a variety of adjustment difficulties in domains like uh, social, emotional, interpersonal, and academic. Um, but also we have to pay attention to the factor, um, the reality that how, and we'll talk about this in the next couple, in a couple slides, 
that actually when we pay attention to what the severity and frequency of the violence is, we see that those youth that are exposed to more severe and frequent violence that's rooted in more patterns of control, course of control, um, these youth tend to have more adjustment difficulties than other domestic violence exposed youth. And I think a really key point to keep, into my, um, keep in mind is that the actual majority of youth who are exposed to violence in their families of origin do not show signs of major maladaptation or adjustment difficulties. And in fact, a substantial number, most research showing between 30 to 40 percent, are actually showing signs of resilience and doing quite well. Um, so on the one hand, we have to focus on the risk and the reality that traumas like exposure to violence causes risks. Um, we also have to keep in mind the majority of youth are showing quite a bit of resilience. Um, and so pulling us together with this next piece around dating violence, we also know that exposure to domestic violence um, during childhood and adolescence is one of the most studied and cited risk markers for a, of a likelihood of violence during adolescence, young adulthood, and also adult relationships such that youth who are exposed to violence in their families are at an increased risk for experiencing intimate partner violence at later developmental stages. Before making that connection more clear between domestic violence exposure and dating violence, I'm going to spend a little bit of, a a little bit of time on what we know about dating violence. So most adolescents are involved in a romantic relationship before turning 18, meaning that these relationships are particularly important for our individual and interpersonal development. So at the same time, we also know that adolescents are going through a host of changes during this time and are often ill-equipped to navigate the complexity of these intimate relationships, especially since in this country and around the world, we have such little emphasis on healthy relationship formation and development. So I want to say a special thanks to all of you who do this important work around healthy relationships, including and especially the Dibble Institute for trying to make this a, a change for our young people. So these biological changes during adolescence, on top of the lack of resources and information on healthy relationships, may partially explain why um, adolescents report pretty high levels of dating violence or abuse. So as you can see on this slide here, we have a huge range in the research. Some studies show as 25% um, or a quarter of adolescents report some forms of dating violence, whereas others report as many as 70% of adolescents. Um, this could be an entirely different webinar, but just briefly, when we're talking about dating violence, we typically are thinking from the violence perspective. We're typically thinking about psychological, physical, and sexual violence, but oftentimes when we're measuring it, we're um, oftentimes focusing more on things like name calling and yelling, which I think we all can agree are not useful and are unhealthy health um, conflict resolution tactics. Um, but it's important for us when we're looking at the research to make sure that we're really measuring dating violence and that we're not saying 70% of youth, but actually it means 70% of youth are engaging in some kind of unhealthy conflict tactics. But regardless, getting those exact estimates will always be imperfect and very difficult. Even if we're talking about the smaller number, we're still saying that a quarter of youth are engaging in problematic relationship behaviors, including dating violence. Um, and we also know that those um, who perpetrate and also who are victim of dating violence are at an increased risk for adverse outcomes during adolescence and beyond. So pulling things back together, we have to think then, okay, we have a little bit of a foundation around what do we mean by exposure to domestic violence. We know that it's associated with an increased risk of dating violence during adolescence. And that really brings us to, that's the kind of the crux of the cycle of violence that we're going to be focusing on today. Um, recent studies have provided support for this high cycle of violence. We can think of it as a theory or a hypothesis, um, such that exposure to violence is an increased likelihood of perpetrating or being victimized. Um, but at the same time, this research has highlighted the, um, the reality that we have a lot to learn. So we know there's this increased risk, but how much more, uh, we need a lot more to explain how this happens. So what is the mechanism through which you, exposure increases one's risk for dating violence? Why does this happen and for whom? So really kind of thinking, are all domestic violence exposed youth at the same risk? Um, some of the research suggests that that's not the case. So um, we can think of, for example, um, there's, it's a pretty small risk. In contra, a high risk of something would be comparison, comparing smoking during pregnancy. We know that smoking during pregnancy is a high risk factor for its impact on a developing fetus. Um, the linkage between domestic violence exposure and dating violence is a smaller risk, suggesting that there's plenty of room for protective and intervening factors, like, for example, healthy relationship education, and plenty of room for resilience as well. So we have a lot of work to do to better understand what happens in this transmission kind of process. 
It's also very important to acknowledge that the majority of youth who are exposed to interparental domestic violence or, um, do not later experience violence in their own relationships, even though there is this risk. So that's kind of the complexity of it. Though we know this risk of dating violence remains, and we know that the majority of youth who do not experience later violence, but my work with this population should suggest that even if domestic violence exposure, if these youth do not engage in dating violence, we know a lot about the ways in which their romantic relationship experiences have been impacted by the violence that they've been exposed to in their homes. And I'll return to that a bit when we go through my studies. So, much of my research to date has been focusing on being more precise in how we measure both domestic violence exposure and domestic violence in the adult literature. In many ways, the adult literature is a lot more advanced than the youth exposure literature. So I've been trying to apply what we know from the adult literature to the youth exposure literature. And this is important because we know that not all domestic violence is the same. So sometimes the violence is more frequent, like occurring monthly, weekly, or even daily. And sometimes it's infrequent, like only one or two instances over the course of the relationship. Sometimes the physical violence is more severe, so it could include incidents like punching or choking. And sometimes it's less severe, but still physical violence, like pushing or shoving. But nevertheless, all of these experiences all fit within the domain of domestic violence. So we've learned from this literature that it's important to take into consideration the characteristics of the violence or the severity of frequency. And in fact, research shows that exposure to more severe and frequent violence increases the risk for dating violence experiences. Hey, Megan, sorry yes. to interrupt. Um, do we mind slowing it down just a little bit? Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm sorry, people. I am a very fast talker, and I am going to work really hard at slowing down. So thank you, Rachel, for that reminder. And feel free to stop me again if I need to. No problem. So, <laughs> we know that exposure to more, we have research to suggest that exposure to more severe and frequent violence increases youth risk for dating violence. So when we look at groups within those who've been exposed to violence, those who have more severe, or we can think of as more chronic exposure experiences, are at a greater risk than those who have more infrequent violence exposure experiences. So there's some differences there. We also know, in addition to physical violence, that uh, violence that's part of a larger cycle or pattern of control or coercive control influences both youth and adult women's outcomes and experiences. So researchers have expanded on this literature and have found that exposure to court, this course of control, which we'll just define in a second, impacts later adjustment above and beyond exposure to physical violence. It's not rooted in course of control. So there's something about this context, this pattern, this power and control that we see going on that particularly impacts youth and their relationships. So we're going to pause here now for just a quick poll to gauge your understanding or knowledge of the concept of course of control. So the question reads, have you ever heard of the term course of control? Okay, I'm going to give you a couple seconds here. All right. OK. That, there that's you go. great. So about 50-50. So I'm going to spend just a couple moments. I'll give you a working definition, and we'll talk a little bit about course of control. Because we're really seeing, so in the adult literature, we know a lot about course of control. We know it's how it's influencing women's relationships, how it influences their experiences. But this is really new and emergent to the youth exposure literature. And I'm hoping that it'll be on the forefront of what we're talking about in our relationship educations as we move forward. So here's a definition of course of control. It's the repetitive use of tactics to regulate and dominate an intimate partner's daily life and restrict their personal liberties. When we think of this definition, we could think of things like battering or spousal abuse, how we typically have thought about domestic violence. So this idea of course of control is central to making distinctions between two main types of violence that have been studied in the adult literature that I've been spending some of my time applying to the youth exposure literature. So the, I'm going to talk through these two main types of violence. So the first one is situational couple violence. This is, this is violence that occurs in the context of conflict. So conflict that escalates to physical violence. Often this is due to issues around anger management or also maybe deficits in conflict resolution skills. So when couples are engaged in an argument, um, one or both parties does not have the conflict resolution skills or the healthy relationship skills to navigate this conflict without resorting to physical violence. This type of violence 
is is really common for those of you who work with with people adults young people we know that pushing and shoving in the context of conflict is shockingly common this type of violence is more mutually perpetrated which means that men and women both are pretty likely to engage in this kind of violence towards one another in relationships though i do want to point out that women do are more likely to experience um, fear of one's partner psychological impacts from this type of violence as well as injury um, it's more likely to see situational couple violence examples in community samples. So oftentimes in schools, you might have a, in a whole school sample, you might have kids responding to a lot of engaging and pushing and shoving in the context of conflict, but less so in this next type we'll discuss in a second. Um, with, so that's situational couple violence. So the idea around conflict is um, situated in particular situational conflict situations. In contrast, course of controlling violence fits more with the definition that you have there on your screen. And this is physical violence that's rooted in a larger general pattern of efforts to control one's partner. So it includes things like surveillance and monitoring and financial abuse. Um, this is still pretty common, but less so than the situational couple violence. And this type of violence is, mostly to be is most likely to be perpetrated by men towards women in different sex couples. When we're trying to study course of controlling violence, we're more likely to have samples um, of people who've experienced course of control when we're talking to, um, working in domestic violence shelters, hospital samples, or in court records. So um, I want to just to draw your attention to this Duluth Power and Control Wheel that was created out of Duluth, Minnesota, one of our first domestic violence shelters in the country. And this is a common figure that we've mostly seen. This is really kind of the essence of course of control. So this kind of typology of making distinctions between situational couple violence and course of controlling violence is imperfect. Um, it's always being worked on and reassessed. Um, so I always recommend that when we're working with youth and trying to make assessments of their experiences, that we're really attuned to the ways in which they're exposed to both physical violence and this course of control, along with their perceptions of the violence, because those things all help influence our understanding of their relationships with others, including the family and into their own romantic relationship experiences. OK, so to bring the first chunk of this webinar together, I've defined and discussed the cycle of violence, giving us a bit of foundation on exposure to violence, dating violence, and what we know about this relationship between early violence exposure experiences and adolescent dating violence relationships. So what I'm going to do now is present some of the research from um, my Young Adults Live and Learn project that Rachel played a central role in when she was in getting her master's and I'm sorry, just her PhD when we were at Auburn. So as I mentioned, this is the Young Adults Live and Learn project, the YALL study. It took place in Auburn, Alabama, so I was very proud of the YALL acronym. I'll never come up with an acronym as good as that one. And to give you a little bit of a sense of the overall project, the scope of the project, the purpose was to examine the diverse family violence and interpersonal relationship experiences of young adults who were exposed to father to mother domestic violence during their childhood and adolescence. So these participants were all between the ages of 18 or 19 and 25. So they were reflecting back on their childhood, adolescent, and then their current experiences. So the first phase was in-depth interviews with um, 25 college attending young adults. And the second phase was comprised, we had 100 youth who were exposed to violence. It says intimate partner violence or IPV there, that's also domestic violence. Um, and we also had a comparison sample of just under 50 youth who did not have any violence experiences. And so we'll pr pr present some data on both of these groups. So we're going to focus first just quickly on some of the data from our first study. And I'll spend more time in the second one where I go through some quotes and really we hear from the participants themselves. So in this first study, our goal was really to test the cycle of violence. So we were asking questions of, do young adults who are exposed to domestic violence report more dating violence compared to the youth who did not have these family violence exposure experiences? And our second question was, when we look at within that domestic violence group, do we see are there differences between those that didn't have violence exposure, the situational couple violence group, and that course of controlling group? So this is really focused on the relationship to, um, between children's exposure to violence and dating violence. So I'll just give you a moment to let your orient your eyes to the, the colors and the no numbers and everything. The yellow represents the youth who were exposed to domestic violence. The gray represents those who were not exposed. So just looking at it as a yes or no for this first slide. 
the numbers in this table are, oh, if you could go back, sorry, Kathy, I was just trying to slow down. The numbers in this table are frequency scores, meaning it's the average number of times that the adolescents reported experiencing the different types of dating violence in their relationships. So as you can see from this table, the youth who were exposed to domestic violence, so the yellow column, reported significantly more dating violence, victimization, and perpetration experiences than the youth who were not exposed to violence. But I do want to point out that even though the yellow columns stick out above the gray columns, the gray columns are kind of are pretty close. So if we just look at, for example, physical violence victimization, those are significantly different. But at the same time, those are practically showing that these youth have pretty high levels in this sample of victimization experiences, regardless of their family life experiences. Go to the next one, please. So I'll give you a second again to orient yourself. Again, we have the yellow with the exposed course of controlling violence. The gray is now those who are exposed to situational couple violence. And then the orange is those that are not domestic violence exposed. And I'll talk through these in a second. Okay. So like these la the last slide, these are frequency scores. So these are the average number of times adolescents reported experiencing each of these types of dating violence in their high school relationships. So unlike the last figure, this figure is broken down such that we are comparing youth exposed to the three di two different violence groups and the no violence group. When clicking through this slide, we can see that youth exposed to course of controlling violence reported significantly more victimization in all of the dating violence domains than those exposed to situational couple violence, with the exception of perpetration. So their perpetration scores were significantly higher, even though they were all domestic violence exposed. Those with the course of controlling violence reported significantly more victimization experiences than those who were exposed to situational couple violence, suggesting that there's different risks for the youth within domestic violence group. In this next slide, We'll focus just on those who were exposed to situational couple violence and no domestic violence. So the yellow column's been kind of ghosted, kind of hidden. And now we're just looking at the situational couple violence and the no domestic violence exposure. And when we look at this group, we still see that there's some differences. So those who were exposed to situational couple violence, even though they had less dating violence experiences than the, the course of controlling group, they were more likely to have dating violence experiences, including physical perpetration, when we compare them to the no domestic violence group. So we still see kind of like a, a stepping stone where course of controlling had the most experiences of dating violence, then situational couple violence, then the no exposure group. If we click one more time, the one thing that stands out as unique is if you look to the far right side with sexual coercion victimization, those who were not exposed to violence had significantly more sexual coercion victimization than those who were exposed to situational couple violence. And that's something that we'll have to explore in further studies to see if that continues to play out. So the key takeaways from this first study was that domestic violence exposed youth report greater dating violence experiences, which supports the cycle of violence hypothesis. But we also see that this idea of the course of control, so the context in which the violence is occurring, whether there's power and control rooted in the violence is also significant in making us better understand who's at a greater risk for dating violence experiences. So this provides us with some support from both the research and the prevention and intervention perspective to make it clear that we're assessing for both physical violence and course of control when we're working with youth who may have been exposed to violence. And though I believe this to be pretty uh, premature based on this not being a, you know, this is a small part of the literature that's just growing, I'm hypothesizing that in the future, we might wanna have targeted prevention and intervention efforts based on these familial contexts within domestic violence. So moving beyond just identifying youth with violence experiences to really having a better understanding about individual family experiences and how that might put youth at different risks. So the findings I've presented to you thus far have been all focused on the research in the assumption that there is this cycle of violence, right? That this is definitely a pattern, that this is a higher risk. But what about the youth who were exposed to violence and their relationships in general, not just the bad ones? 
What about those who do not have violent or abusive romantic relationships at all? What are we missing by not focusing at all on them, which we're not really doing in the literature? And how do they feel about our research when they read our research just constantly showing risk, 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 and not kind of showing them any pathways that look more like resilience and healthy relationships? And that brings us to our second study. So this study was published in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence, and I'll make sure that Rachel and Kathy, Kathy have this publication so that it can be accessible for any of you who are interested in reading the full project. This was based on my um, former student, Camille Carlson's master's thesis. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist in Minneapolis now. So for her thesis, she was wanting to move beyond dating violence and no dating violence to describe the ways in which these DV exposed youth, um, their exposure experiences influence their relationships over time. So we asked, what are these youth's relationship experiences? And how does the nature of the violence, so the physical violence and the course of control, influence their, young, their relationships over time? So the total sample was 25, but we only had two men in the study, and so the journal editors asked us to just focus on the, uh, on the 23 women, so that's what we did. Um, so this was based off of 23 women. They were around the age of 20. They were all college attending, which means this is a unique sample. You know, the generalizability is, you know, I, qualitative research is not supposed to be generalizable, but I think we have to be particularly cautious when we're talking about college versus non-college attending samples, because this is a, a unique population that despite, or in, in the case of these youth, despite their adversities, they're still college attending at a four-year institution. It's relatively diverse in terms of race, um, race and ethnicity. Um, they were all reporting on um, opposite sex or different sex relationships with the exception of one young adult. Um, they were largely talking about biological fathers who were abusive to their biological mothers. Their mothers were in a variety of marital statuses with the abusive former or current husband. And even though these were all college attending youth, we have about half the sample reported experiencing at least one, but oftentimes multiple public assistance support. So it's showing that there was some diversity um, in the sample in terms of socioeconomic status. I'm going to give you a moment to let your eyes orient to this uh, figure and I'll talk through it, this table, and I'll talk through it in a second. Okay, so on the left column, you see that there's the participants, these are participants' names, but they're pseudonyms or they're fake names. And if you click on this next part, we have these groups organized by um, the type of violence. So these Brianna to Allison are situational couple violence, so youth who were exposed to situational couple violence. And then Jasmine to Emma, we can see were exposed to course of controlling violence. Um, next to the participants' names, we have whether they were exposed to violence that they described as severe or frequent. And in the situational couple violence group, you can see there's less severe and less frequent violence, but some people were exposed to, for example, violence that was severe, but only happened to a couple times, or violence that happened regularly, but maybe involved grabbing, which is, of course can be a traumatic experience for youth to be exposed to, but does not entail some of the more severe acts of violence. If we look at the course of controlling group, we can see that the majority of these participants were exposed to violence that was either or severe or violent in nature. So I'm going to be focusing on um, these youth romantic relationship experiences. We'll first start with high school, and that's what I'll talk through the, the 19 participants who had um, high school relationships as well as the participants who did not have any relationships during the time of high school. Go to the next slide. Okay. So just as an overview, 15 of the participants had high school and college relationships. Um, we asked them to focus on their most salient or their most serious relationship during these time periods. Um, most of them only had one serious relationship, um, so that wasn't, a diff that wasn't a challenge. Four had only um, high school relationships, one had only during college, and three participants had not had any romantic relationship experiences, um, but we included them in the study because the, their discussion of their decisions to not be in romantic relationships was largely driven by their experiences within their home and the domestic violence exposure. So these relationships varied in length, but they were pretty lengthy, almost two and a half years, which is actually a little bit longer than we typically think of high school and college relationships. So a little bit longer in length. And we categorize these relationships into either non-abusive or abusive based on their descriptions and discussions as well as their own words around whether they were abusive or not. So the non-abusive ones entailed no explicit discussion of physical violence or no physical abuse. 
um, and I'll go into those more depth, of course, whereas the abusive did discuss explicit discussions of physical violence or non-physical abuse. Okay, so bringing us back to this table again, now we've added addition, additional columns. So it's the same Brianna down to Emma, but now we have the categorization of the romantic relationship experiences. And I'll let you just kind of look over this for a moment. So when you first look at this, it might not jump out at you that there's any kind of patterns. I think when I first looked at it, I probably didn't notice anything that really jumped out at me. But if we click to this next point and we highlight those within the course of controlling group, what we actually see is that all of the participants who had non-abusive high school relationships all fall in, fell in the course of controlling group. So this is in some ways in conflict with what I just presented in our first study, where I was saying that those who were exposed to course of control were at a greater risk for abusive relationships than those in these other experiences. Well, it might also be, this isn't a statistically you know, significant finding, this isn't a quantitative study, but just visually looking at this, maybe there's something unique about the course of controlling group and their likelihood also of being in a non-abusive and often quite healthy romantic relationship. So we'll spend some time talking through some of those, but that's really kind of a visual pattern that you might be able to see. If we go to the next slide and we focus on the college relationships, the key thing to, that stands out here is that none of these participants were in an abusive relationship. So I understand that the majority of you all um, work with high school youth um, or of adolescence is my understanding, but I wanna acknowledge that even though we have this sample, that's roughly half of the sample, had some high school abusive relationship experiences, none of the participants were in an abusive relationship when they participated with us in our study. So we'll come back to that for a little bit towards the end. So focusing on the non-abusive high school relationships, they ranged in length, level of commitment, and quality. Six of the eight were described as healthy, supportive, developmentally appropriate, and ended just kind of amicably, normally. Two of the relationships were not abusive, but they described boyfriends, and these were all boyfriends um, who weren't fully committed to the relationship or used drugs. So they weren't unhealthy, and this, they weren't abusive, um, and they still were quite supportive in a lot of ways, but we wouldn't describe them as healthy and, um, healthy and supportive relationships necessarily at the same way. Um, these Boyfriends all served as the main source of support and protection. Uh, participants described how they helped them escape or avoid dangerous encounters with their maritally violent fathers. The boyfriends and their families opened up their, their homes as safe places. So not all boyfriends knew that there was domestic violence per se, though most did, but often they knew that there was just something at home that wasn't safe or good. And so their home was always a safe place that the participants could go to. In some instances, um, they lied about the participant and the mother's whereabouts, particularly when mothers and children went into hiding at domestic violence shelters. And as this example by Caitlin um, provides, they sometimes intervened in, intervened in violent encounters. So Caitlin said, my boyfriend walked in and actually pulled my dad off my brother. I was like extremely grateful for that. So this is important to point out because when we're doing relationship education, I think it's also important for us to be thinking about what kinds of support are peers and romantic partners providing and how can we help them know when they're being helpful but also potentially putting themselves in dangerous situations we were really surprised by the number of discussions we heard from our participants of pretty dangerous situations that romantic partners and peers were put, um, put themselves in to help their friend or their girlfriend so in contrast to the non-abusive relationships we have these abusive high school relationships so they had um, four of the participants described having physical violence victimization that ranged in severity and frequency. Allison says, he never broke any bones. He never hurt my face. The last time that I saw him, he did push me down the stairs, but they were short stairs like I was not injured. And I point this out and use it as a quote because uh, this is a pretty common pattern we have in both the young adult literature and the literature of studies I've done with moms, where we have this idea of domestic violence or physical violence looks like broken eyes, um, sorry, broken bones, black eyes, really severe kinds of injuries. And that oftentimes leads people to minimize what they're experiencing is actually physical violence because we have this idea of what domestic violence actually looks like. So this kind of highlights that minimizing. Participants also discussed verbal abuse victimization. 
And then most commonly, the participants describe the course of control and um, victimization. So surveillance and monitoring, controlling appearance or clothing, limiting independence and autonomy. So Elizabeth says, her boyfriend would tell her that you look like a tramp for wearing this or that. You should wear more makeup for me when you come to my house to visit because I don't like that you look, I don't like that you come back from work looking like a sweaty mess. Mia explained, how people would put up pictures on Facebook and if I was standing too close to a, next to a boy, he'd get very upset and say, you're standing too close to him. I don't even know why you're going out. So the participants described most predominantly these course of control victimization experiences, but almost, I think all of the young adults or most of the young adults described an overlap with at least two forms of abuse. So maybe experiencing physical victimization as well as course of control, or in some cases experiencing all of these forms of abuse in their high school relationships. All of these relationships ended during high school or the beginning of college, and they were all ended by the participants, by the young women, and they ended the relationships for a variety of reasons. They ended the relationships when they recognized the relationship as abusive, um, when they feared escalation, so in situations where there was course of control but not physical violence, they sometimes were fearful that it was becoming physical violence and they knew that was abuse, so they decided to end the relationship. But they also did so due to the interference of or influence from others. So this was sometimes uh, manifested from moms, so moms helping daughters recognize signs of abuse. But we also had one example of a father who helped a young adult or a high school student realize her relationship was abusive. In the example we have here, we have London, her best friend, encouraged her to get away from the abusive relationship now because they both know what abusive relationships can lead to because her best friend had been there and was aware of what her um, London's mother's marriage was like. So these supportive figures played a role in helping them end relationships. Another important factor, particularly for the young ad uh, the adolescents that lived in small towns, was going away to college. So Jasmine says, and then I got to college and there were all these different types of people and I didn't have to be stuck with anyone I didn't want to be stuck with. No one could be part of my life if I didn't want them to be. And this leaving home for college helped her, in her eyes, break a cycle of violence where she saw her mom was trapped in their small town by her marriage with her father. But she was leaving, she was going away to college and she didn't have to be in an abusive relationship because there was other people out there. So aside from whether their relationships were abusive or not abusive, the participants all engaged in comparing behaviors, comparing their parents' marriage and abuse to their own high school partners and relationships. Um, those who were not in a relationship or who were in a non-abusive relationship during high school described how they made these comparisons before the relationship started, so when they were choosing partners, or maybe during early stages, like during early dating. These young adults expressed caution, hesitancy and avoided, particularly those who had no relationships, talked about avoiding relationships. They described how their domestic violence exposure led them to be more vigilant of red flags for domestic violence and they actively sought out certain types of male partners. Ellie explained, I think I observe things a lot more than people who come from happy homes because they don't know what to look for and I know what relationships could turn to in the future. For participants who were in abusive high school relationships, they also made these comparisons between their relationships and their parents' marriage, but they did so either during the relationship or then also reflecting back on the relationship. Um, they, they also similarly kind of looked out for these red flags when they were in the relationship, but they also described altering their behavior as victims and in some cases mutual perpetrators when they were engaging in violence themselves. So Blair says, it's like, that's the way you fix conflict, just hitting, and then you deal with it. I see now that hitting is not solving anything. So through her ongoing relationship with her boyfriend and his communication with her, she stops hitting as a form of conflict resolution. The participants described how they recognized similarities in their mothers to themselves, and especially in how the moms minimized violence and abuse. Jasmine explained how she had initially constantly kind of brushed off her boyfriend's abuse, and then she realized, I'm doing this because I saw my mom do it, thinking, oh, it's okay because he still loves me. But she made changes once she got to college. Sarah explained that her mother is a people pleaser, and she feared that she is also a people pleaser because she lets people push her around. So these young adults were actually very active in recognizing these patterns of behaviors within themselves and making changes when they shifted into college and more adult relationships. 
So just as a reminder here, all of the relationships in college were non-abusive, but a, about seven of the participants were not in college relationships. Nevertheless, even though these youth had left the home, they were on their own in college, they all described the ways in which the domestic violence exposure influenced their initiation of relationships, how they maintained and managed them, as well as their perceptions of college and romantic relationships. Those who are not in romantic relationships describe this as being particularly the reason why they weren't in a college relationship, though they all had um, desire to date and marry in the future. These participants actively sought out romantic partners dissimilar to their fathers. Ellie explained how her college partner was very different from her dad. He's just very easygoing. He's not like my dad in any aspect. He is a lot more caring. These participants acti actively avoided potential partners that they met out in college, similar to their fathers. They had really enhanced their internal tools for detecting red flags. And their exposure experiences really shaped their beliefs regarding what was acceptable and unacceptable behavior. But some of these participants did remain quite guarded and avoided deeper intimacy in their relationships. So Emma says, I feel like domestic violence exposure has made me very skeptical. I am very picky. I have that wall and you better start chiseling it because it's not coming down anytime soon. I'm just like very protective of myself. All of my experiences with my dad and my stepdad have turned me into a woman that is not going to let any man in my way. I'm not going to let you hurt me, harm me, control me. Like I am very much set in my wants, my needs. I feel like that it can be very positive, but it can also be very negative in the sense that I don't, I do have that wall up and I don't let people in. Finally, I wanna point out that it wasn't just the domestic violence exposure experiences that informed these college relationships, but also uh, the dating violence experiences that some of the youth had. So these participants described how they were really surprised and felt regret that they missed early red flags of abusive high school relationships because they thought they knew better from their own family experiences. Elizabeth said, I didn't recognize the more subtle things because I'm like, I know what abuse looks like. It looks like yelling and screaming and hitting walls and throwing grills, when really it can be a lot more subtle. It can be little like snide digs that happen over the course of several months. And through, the, through these experiences of both domestic violence exposure and having an abusive high school relationship, these participants were able to recognize these different red flags and it enhanced their, not, their selection of finding a non-abusive partner. So to wrap up with some implications and discussions, our studies provide support that there is some cycle of violence, but there's more complexity than this. So whilst yes, we had half of the sample had a, a roughly half had abusive relationships in high school, we also had a lot of participants with really healthy and supportive rel relationship experiences. And just to highlight the fact that only the youth that had been exposed to course of control reported having non-abusive or healthy high school relationships. So it might be that romantic relationships for these youth who have experienced a lot of family trauma might be particularly protective. And yet we still need to be mindful of these safety concerns for romantic partners in these situations. I also wanna point out that the youth who were, the only people who had never had a um, romantic relationship were exposed to situational couple violence. So even though these homes were less severe, and they had less chronic violence, they still created a sense of conflict and caution and avoidance in the romantic relationships, suggesting that there's still something to these kinds of relationships and we shouldn't just focus on course of control, but those influences might be different for the participants. So consistent with survivor theory, which comes from the adult literature, I think it's important for us to acknowledge the agency, the active agency, and not the passivity that these young adults expressed in navigating their romantic relationships. They use their violence exposure experiences to help them detect red flags, to guide their selection of partners, and to make adjustments with their, in their own behavior and relationships and to end decision and end relationships too. So we often think of these earlier relationships as providing scaffolding for adult relationships, like the idea that a healthy relationship in high school is gonna to lead to a healthy relationship in college. But for these youth, what we actually saw was patterns of some domestic violence exposure and sometimes an unhealthy relationship. And this helped lead participants to relationships that were particularly healthy and developmentally appropriate in college. 
which I think gives us some room for some interventions in high school relationships that then can help give tools for people as they move into young adulthood. Kathy, I'm going to go ahead and skip to this last quote, if that's okay. I just want to acknowledge this last quote that comes from, um, I'm going to conclude with a quote that comes from a young adult whose mother participated in one of my studies. This young adult has remained in touch with me over the years as she's very interested in research on domestic violence exposure and resilience. And what we just slipped over was this discussion around resilience and post-traumatic growth. And what we see evidence in this quote is the ways in which this participant describes how their youth exposure experiences is part of who she is and we can see the post-traumatic growth and how she describes her experiences. So I'll read this quote. One feeling I remember, and of course I couldn't put into words until much older, was that throughout my experience as a child witness to intimate partner violence, I could almost sense the implicit bias of professionals that worked with me. I experienced some pretty awful stuff in my home growing up, absolutely. But the truth is, I was a relatively resilient kid throughout. Being, inter being interviewed by different professionals, I often felt they were searching for particular answers or for me to exhibit some expected behavior rather than learning about what made me uniquely me. Another thing that has always bothered me is that the narrative that people like me um, just have, have thrived despite my experiences. I firmly believe I am who I am as a direct result of my home growing up, violence and all. Growing up, I saw examples of extreme emotion dysregulation, manipulative communication, physical violence, parentification. In some ways, my coping skills and personality grew in opposition to these behaviors. I also had the steadfast example of survivorship in my mother along the way. For all the ways in which she couldn't love my mother and I in healthy ways much of the time, there was still some good in my father. Leaving space for that good, for his complexity, has allowed me to thank him in some ways for the goodness in me. All of this leads me developing what I know as a healthy emotional intelligence, which has helped me immensely in my relationship, profession, and in my own self-inquiry. All of this is to say that all of this is to say that resilience and growth after trauma, at least from my own experience, is probably due to a complex mix of heritage, time and place, DNA, and probably some magic. Also, dogs. I think this quote really well exemplifies the resilience and growth that young people that have been exposed to violence can demonstrate. And I think that when we're working, whether in a research capacity or as practitioners or professionals, we have to keep that resilience in mind, even though we know there's this risk, because we have to move beyond just focusing on the risk for the better of these youth. So I want to thank the young adults who shared their experiences in my research project, my research team, including Rachel, um, the Dibble Institute for giving me this opportunity to present on this topic and some of the work that I've done, as well as a couple of funding sources through Auburn University and the Alabama Agricultural Experiment Station. So thank you very much for your time. And we have some time for questions now. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I love hearing that stuff even though i was a part of it hearing it all over again is awesome and we have a couple of people including christina fuller and kate reed who said that this was a great webinar and thank you for presenting your information um, and then we've got some questions too so the first one is from elizabeth billingsley and she asked is there a higher incidence for youth who are directly abused instead of just exposed to parents abusing one another that's a great question. Um, so when I talked a little bit about the issues in measurement, um, this is one of them. So oftentimes researchers do not tease out um, whether youth have been directly exposed, like when you think of child abuse, and then exposed to violence. Um, the best studies we have will ask about both of those things so that we're able to understand both of those components. I think research shows can very consistently that if youth are exposed to violence and are directly abused, the increased risk goes up pretty exponentially. So we're adding kind of cumulative risks. Um, when it comes to perpetrating dating violence or victimizing dating violence, the literature looks a little bit more supportive of the negative impact of exposure to violence. But in general, kind of any kind of family violence exposure experiences do put youth at risk for their own dating violence or adult intimate partner violence experiences. Okay, thank you for that. And then our next question, comes from Janet and she asked how frequent were each type of uh, dating violence exposure so course of control and situational like how, how frequently were they exposed um, so the I think well the the course of control versus situational couple violence those are like the general context of the whole family life so that's kind of the whole thing that's going on um, 
So for those who were exposed to coercive controlling violence, that was really described as kind of a consistent pattern. Like their home life always felt kind of like full of that 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 the other cycle of violence, so the tension building, the violence, a honeymoon phase, sometimes the honeymoon phase fades away. So that was a really kind of pervasive part of their family's lived experiences. Those who were exposed to situational couple violence, there was a variability. So some participants described how there was regular physical violence going on. Others described how, like, yes, I was exposed to violence. They agreed to participate in the study, but they maybe only saw, and I don't mean to say only to minimize, but they may have only seen violence occur on one or two times. And maybe they had other conflict issues, maybe not healthy family dynamics, but the violence wasn't like a central part of their family life. But there's still quite a bit of variability. Okay. And then um, do you have any ideas about, this is from Jeff, do you have any ideas about what accounts for the observed resilience and the work that you hmm. have done? You know, it was interesting in our sample, within our sample, despite, you know, some of the students that had some of the worst violence exposure experiences, they were valedictorians. They were captains of the cheerleading squad. They were local and local, um, very, um, I'm sorry, had leadership roles in like future farmers of America. Um, so they definitely, there was some educational component that definitely seemed to help build resilience and provide a protective factor. Many of the youth talked about um, throwing themselves into school and trying to commit to as many activities at school as possible to keep themselves from avoiding to be at home. Um, some youth in a different study, one of our uh, my other students, Kathleen, for her dissertation, she focused on their peer relationships. So some had really supportive peer networks that were particularly helpful. Uh, the quote that I read at the end, I'm going to call her Rachel. I know Rachel was really involved in theater and drama in high school, which she always says is like this special group of people because everybody knew about her family issues, everybody was very supportive, it was like um, a really healthy outlet. So I do think there's something to kind of the peer dynamics, academics, extracurriculars, um, having supportive relationships with their mothers, if their mothers um, were healthy and able to do so, um, some siblings. But I think there's an interpersonal relationship component that's really important, an educational component that's really important. And I think that that also emphasizes the limits of this study. So these students were in this particular study were all college attending. So they had, they were able to make that academic jump. I think we know a lot, a lot less about young adults who were exposed to violence when they were growing up who were not. So maybe that were in, went into the military right away or who are working on family farms or who ha were imprisoned. Um, we know much less about kind of their pathways. And if we understood their pathways, we would maybe be able to understand some gaps and areas where we can really help strengthen resilience. Awesome. And I think we have time, <clears throat> excuse me, for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. Um, and we've got one saying, could you please describe the recruitment process for the qualitative study? Yes. Um, so the participants recruited through a variety of ways. So we used a lot of social media recruitment. Um, we did recruitment in classes. Um, we did recruitment through flyers throughout campus. There were certain buildings that people seemed to pick up the flyers pretty quickly. Um, but I think social media flyers, we also advertise the, you know, at Auburn University, they have an online newspaper that's really widely followed. And so we also paid for them to tweet about the study. Okay. $25 a tweet. Oh, wow. Really? It was that much? Yeah. yeah oh, wow. Expensive tweet. <laughs> well, obviously well worth it. <laughs> And then um, we have your study engaged college student participants. Do you think that influences the outcomes? Yes. So their adult yeah. IPD no. experience. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Say that again. Sorry. Yeah. So your the study engaged college student participants. So do you think that influences their outcomes? I'm thinking it, it, they're asking in relation to their college relationships. Yeah, I think so. And I also think that, you know, they all were in like, I mean, well, that's not true. Some students were struggling with mental health and various things, but um, they were college attending, for the most part, doing pretty well. Um, I do just want to point out that I think there's a lot of benefits to studying young adults because they were able to describe that context of course of control. They had a little bit of distance from their whole lives, home lives and had some intellectual development beyond high school students. 
um, but also I would have had a very hard time recruiting high school students who were exposed to violence at my previous institution just because of safety and ethical issues. So there's also kind of logistical benefits of young adults as well. But yes, a co having college only attending samples like in the qualitative study certainly limits our generalizability to other young adults. Okay. I think that's it. I know there are a lot of other questions that we've got here, um, but we can pass these along and make sure they get answered um, so that, you know, everything gets a response in. Absolutely. Hopefully we can help help you and your research and all of that other stuff for these other questions. Um, so we just want to say thank you for joining us today and thank you, Megan, for sharing your work with us. There's a brief survey at the end of this webinar, so we really appreciate you taking the time to provide us some feedback by completing that survey. And some of you asked about the availability of the webinar, and it will be available in three days at the link that you see here. Or you can email Kathy or myself at our name. And then please stay in touch, check out our website, subscribe to our newsletter, like us on Facebook, follow us on LinkedIn, call us if you have any questions, or like I said, feel free to, to send us an email. And last but not least, we have another uh, webinar coming up right before Valentine's Day. So it will be presented by Marlene Pearson, who is the author of our Love Notes and Relationship Smarts. Rachel, I think we might have lost Rachel. So anyway, I just oh, want to hear. Oh, okay. So I think, I think we're losing her. But anyway, thank you so much for attending. If you have any questions, make sure you contact us and have a great day.